This question concerns about the asexual reproduction. Uh, so any resulting new cells through this asexual reproduction, uh, of course, because they are cloned, any resulting so-called daughter cell through asexual reproduction will be genetically simply identical clones, then how can we consider that as a, are they independent because simply just like copying a clone or anything? Still, uh, yeah, through asexual reproduction, one cell will become only two. And DNA is exactly copied into these two different daughter cells. Still, once they're made through this asexual reproduction, unless they are part of a multicellular organ, each of these new daughter cells will have their own independent life. So whether their genetic identity is 100% uh, same or not, still each of these daughter cells will uh, exhibit their independent life form and adaptability. That's one thing. Another thing is, even still at this stage, although the chances are very small, but at least one, even with one round of this DNA replication and the cell division, still there is a chance of mutation. And anytime you have this mutation, each mutation will affect differently and the resulting cells. So if that mutation affects the function of any gene, then of course it will uh, show some differences and independence. That's what I can uh, answer to this. So same thing, uh, similar question was here. Uh, genetic variations possible in asexual reproduction? Yes, it is possible uh, through mutation. So like E. coli or any prokaryotic bacterial cell, assuming, assuming they are reproducing throughout only entirely through asexual reproduction of this copying, even with that, each round of this reproduction, still there is a small portion of a mutation occur that will become the source of a new variation. And another thing is, even with basically such asexual reproduction scheme, even the bacteria have very weird behavior of exchanging some portion of their genes with other individuals sometimes. Just like we are doing this in, in the course of sexual reproduction of this eukaryotes. Uh, do cells have a survival instinct too? This too is very interesting point to me because then who else? Uh, I, uh, I might wonder myself. Then who else has also survival instinct other than cell? I don't know. I cannot think of anything else other than cell. Any, anybody who can just come up with any answer? Like, who else? Cell will have a survival instinct. What is the survival instinct? The maximum. Eh? Trying to or display or manifest the maximum ability of adaptation is a so-called we call as a survival instinct. Okay, but who uh, who else has this survival instinct? Individual organism. Individual organism is basically made of cells, and the the reason why individual organisms show some survival instincts is because of out of this, individual cells have this adaptability and uh, exhibiting as a, in the form of survival instincts, to me at least. So uh, to give you a straightforward answer to this, of course, yes. Cells 
do have a survival instinct and because any adaptability, all different complexity, interaction and the response to stimuli is not actually culminating in as a survival instinct. And we all know, presumably, we all know why cells possess such characters. So this question also, <clears throat> the variation, uh, we casually say the variation, our sexual reproduction is the one <clears throat> reason, or maybe perhaps the only reason why we have so much variation in this population. But if you really think about fundamental uh, concept, the ultimate source of variation only comes from mutation. This, the appearance of increased variation through uh, sexual reproduction is only the enhancing this combination of such variation among different individuals because we are shuffling, basically, we are shuffling our genes with somebody else, somebody else who has uh, the, the totally different genetic background, and then if you shuffle those genes, then obviously it will show uh, some different looking uh, variation. However, where did you, where did you variation from? I'm talking about the variation from the beginning, from your Luca. Okay, where did you get it? Okay, then through mutation, that's the way. Why your genetic DNA sequence is different from your the original common ancestor, which is Luca? How did you do? What did you do? Okay, I went through mutation for a long time. That is the only. So, whether I have some different what kind of a variation, or my partner in the sexual reproduction have another such type of variation, so that we got together and then uh, agreed exchange our whole genetic thing so that uh, showcase some different outlook but still my variation source is uh, through my mutation from uh, my long long uh, standing ancestors and my partner's uh, variation also uh, came from such route that's the only thing so uh, so reproduction and mutation, uh, the uh, difference, the big difference is reproduction. In the case of a sexual reproduction, is a simply reshuffling whatever your variation have is through exchange and trying to make different in your offspring. In other words, your genetic variation, your partner's genetic variation, because you have this reshuffling. You are not changing, but simply reshuffling. As, so as a result, your children's, your children's genetic variation may look different, but still, in terms of a basic fundamental DNA sequence-wise, yours and your partner's, that's it. Nobody else's is the, what your children have. So that's the reproduction. And mutation is ultimately something that game changer. Through mutation, you can only change some your whatever you have original the dna sequence can be changed into something else that's the mutation so that's why i call with confidence i call mutation is the only source of genetic variation ultimately ultimate source of variation is only mutation Uh, hypothetically, human genes, animal genes combined together in the controlled environment uh, uh, already. People have already done it. It's not hypothetically anymore. Long, long, long time people have done this. For example, mouse genes, uh, human genes try to combine to produce something else uh, in many occasions. Of course, that hybrid such hybrid does not come as a 
only cellular level, so that's why it is still permitted. But when you try to produce some very specific type of antibody, that is a routine trick of try to uh, fuse uh, mouse, particular mouse tissue and particular cancer, human cell or any other uh, organism types of cell and fuse together making this hybrid cell to produce a huge amount of specific antibody as one example. And another occasion when you are uh, curious about some particular function of a gene, human genes, uh, people usually uh, do is put entire human cell fused together with mouse cell and in that case mouse cell will kill every human chromosome only sparing only one chromosome like we have a 23 different chromosome we right? and let's say we fuse them and usually this mouse cell will kill all these uh, chromosome human chromosome they know oh this is a foreign chromosome but occasionally only allow uh, one particular human chromosome to survive inside of a uh, mouse cell. In using that technique, we are focusing in like genes on that particular survived chromosome still remain survived in the mouse cell and then we'll have some function and then we analyze. So practically there are lots of such experiments uh, going on. And uh, of course it is also uh, obvious that uh, more and more brave uh, uh, attempt to have a bizarre occasion of a fusion between human cell and uh, other sources so can also be uh, easily uh, attempted in the near future, of course, in these days. Uh, when bacteria become, this is a whole issue and we are also going to touch this issue later on in our lecture. Uh, so this is like medicine, for example, antibiotics, those drugs that kill bacteria cells uh, and in these days uh, more and more bacteria become resistant, immune to such drugs so all these developed uh, antibiotics become obsolete and that's a very serious problem because we don't have any uh, weapon then. But is this the, on, another example of response to stimuli? Of course, yes. Uh, Many, there are many different mechanisms by which bacteria cells obtain such uh, resistance mechanism. But uh, one straightforward uh, way we can think of is, let's say this is a bacteria cell, and bacteria cell will have this one, uh, the channel through which drug, antibiotics drug, will enter, okay, and if this drug will, if they can go into without any uh, interference inside of this bacteria cell, then it will kill bacteria cell. But mutation can always happen. So what if this mutation, this particular channel is blocked through this mutation and this drug cannot go any longer. This cannot, drug, this drug cannot penetrate the cell. Then now, this bacteria become resistant. And it is a real-time scenario, what's happened in reality. I'm not just making any story up here. Uh, how, the, how this bacteria obtain this particular uh, the resistance mechanism? Through mutation. Once they sense, oh, drug is coming, a drug is coming, and there is a, some kind of natural selection force and mutation occur. Mutation, just like natural selection, this drug is behaving some kind of selection force. So any spontaneous mutation that will block this thing will survive. So this is, of course, uh, another example of such uh, visually trying to respond to maximize their adaptation and only a few lucky ones survive and then become dominant. Huh. 
this uh, whenever they have this metabolism uh, always involved this you know, the transaction, traffic of energy, of course. But when you have this response to stimuli, of course, usually, a lot of times, and in most of the cases, this response requires some uh, spending energy. So, yeah, uh, it is an energy-requiring procedure. However, in strictly speaking, this response to stimuli doesn't necessarily mean means always it will require energy. Some, some examples of such response to stimuli may be accomplished without even spending a, a, a energy. That is possible. Okay. Simply trying to adapt, but in, in doing so, when the energetically, simply their response is simply energetically favorable, then it is possible, at least conceptually. However, Maintaining this homeostasis always, without any exception, always require, involve the uh, uh, spending of energy. Because, why? Because it is something that try to make the condition unnaturally. My point is, in responding to stimuli, some of the response could be simply natural way. Here, maybe, I missed some very important metabolic differences, which I should have maybe mentioned already, is this. Chemical reaction. Chemical reaction happens, yes. And as a result, chemical reaction, as a result of chemical reaction, either energy is released or energy uh, to start the chemical reaction, you have to provide the energy. Why is that so? What's the difference between any chemical reaction that give out the energy and any chemical reaction that require energy to begin with? I briefly mentioned actually. I, I, I remember now. Whenever you try to do something that you're not supposed to do. So this is something that spontaneous. Is the reaction spontaneous? Which means it will occur naturally. Let's say there is a hill. Let's say you have a rock on top of the hill. You try to roll this rock to the bottom. Is it spontaneous? Which means how easy is it, is it going to be? If you try to roll this rock to the bottom from the top, will it be easy or difficult? Easy. We call this as a spontaneous. Why? Because, like, let's say this is an energy. Let's, this whole height is a uh, metaphor of energy. From the high energy level to make anything to the lower energy level, which means now once this rock reaches the rock bottom, then now it will, once it has this much energy, right? This much energy, but now it has lost this much energy. Now it became much, much, much more stable. What did I say at the beginning of the lecture? Everybody in nature wants to become stable. That's the natural way. So it became so stable by releasing its once high energy like this. So that's why it is so spontaneous. It will happen. It will happen naturally. Spontaneous means the reaction will happen naturally without any 
uh, complex manipulation in principle, of course, in principle, right? So that's the spontaneous reaction, and that is the reason why any spontaneous reaction you end up with releasing energy. Energy will be released at the end. Now, consider the other way around. Starting point of this, you want to roll this rock up to the hill. Is it going to be easy or difficult? It's going to be damn difficult. It, does, it will take huge, huge amount of power, right? Power, the energy. That's why it is non-spontaneous. This reaction going backward from the bottom to top is going to be non-spontaneous reaction because it will require huge amount of energy. I'm not saying it is impossible. It is possible. So by definition, non-spontaneous reaction, it is not something that it is impossible to occur, but to occur, to make it happen, it, you have to spend energy. Okay. That's the non-spontaneous reaction. Okay. So, in response, <coughs> in response to external stimulus, you may be lucky so that uh, by doing so, uh, all you have to do is like clicking one such several couple of a spontaneous reaction. In that occasion, energy, you don't really have to spend energy. However, why always this uh, homeostasis uh, maintenance always uh, required energy? Because by definition, homeostasis is what? With the changing environment, you are trying to make certain condition so constant internal. Which means that is unnatural, right? It is something against some chemical equilibrium. So if you are trying this unnatural thing, whenever you're trying this such unnatural thing, then you have to, uh, you have to open your wallet, right? So that's why you always uh, have to spend energy in this homeostasis reaction. It's already 40. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and this one, what's the difference or relationship between glucose and EP? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, if you were like encountering glucose and ATP for the first time, yeah, no wonder. Uh, glucose is the macromolecule, of course. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is glucose. All this red line indicates the covalent bond. So this is glucose. Each carbon, each carbon, six carbons are connected together through covalent bond. That is, is the glucose. Okay. ATP, on the other hand, phosphorus, uh, to be more accurate, phosphate group, PPP, three phosphate group are attached one type of, and a different type of whatever chemical. So this is basically ATP. So we are just uh, comparing apples and orange over here. So they are two different things. But both of them can be used as an energy source. Why? Both of them can be used energy source. Why? Somebody can uh, can somebody tell me why? What did I say about whenever something is happening, energy is released? Something. What's something? Whenever you do some spontaneous reaction. Yeah, break. You break. Breaking. It's a human and everybody's nature. Breaking is something natural, maybe. So, uh, I love breaking. So, that's the spontaneous reaction. No, 
in reality, spontaneous reaction means this energy. Why this spontaneous reaction release the energy? To become more stable. Why it becomes stable? Because it now contains less energy, more stable. So whenever you release whatever you have originally, the energy, then you become more stable, and that's why you become spontaneous reaction. Here, those guys have too much money. Glucose, one, two, three, four, five, six. Four, two, three, four, five, actually. Covalent bond. Each covalent bond. What did I say about covalent bond? It takes, yeah, it's hard to break, and it means it contains high amount of energy. Yeah, it may be hard, but once you break, then you can get a good reward. That's why it can become a good source of energy. You break it, then energy will be released. ATP, same thing. You break this, you break this, then it becomes blank. You break this, it becomes blank. You break this part, you be it becomes what? ATP. This become containing much, a little less energy. So both of them can uh, uh, function as an energy source, but the special thing about special thing about this ATP is it's something kind of a chosen one. For some reason, in the beginning, cells decided to use ATP as our special currency. Whenever we require energy, instead of bringing glucose, in, that's a kind of inconvenient form of energy, rather than bring the whole glucose down and here is my money, we conveniently bring ATP and hey, this is my cash. So that's the difference. ATP is a, a very convenient form of energy in every different uh, occasions whenever cells require the input and spending energy. Uh, somehow we have become uh, so accustomed to using ATP. Glucose, of course, on the other hand, uh, glucose can also release the energy, but in reality, the the way use, we use glucose is this, isn't it? Just like you also have in your lecture handout somewhere. Actual relationship between ATP and glucose is we have a glucose and you break down this breaking down is we call as a uh, catabolic reaction, which is energy releasing, spontaneous reaction. So energy will require uh, will be released in the form, and using that glucose breaking down activity, you are trying to convert. ADP into ATP. So this energy will be provided into because to make ATP from ADP you need energy, right? So that's the real life relationship between glucose and ATP. To generate ATP uh, as a heterotroph, like unlike if you are capable of photosynthesis you have to start with this glucose from somebody else's and break it down. Okay. And why do you break down the glucose? Because you need to release the energy from the chemical bond of glucose. Why? Why do you need the energy? To input in this process of synthesis from ADP into ATP. Once you generate this ATP, now it can it can do whatever their the respective function, and as a result, it will return to ADP after releasing energy, right? That energy is what we need, actually. So that's the relationship. Instead, for example, uh, some of you may think, hey, why do we uh, make our life so complex? Why do we use 
simply glucose whenever we need the energy. Good question. Yeah. However, there is a mechanically speaking, there is a, some limitation. That's why rather using directly using glucose breakdown as an energy form, but it is much more efficient and safer on um, many, many reasons why cell have decided to use ATP instead of through this indirect conversion. Yeah, so many students have this uh, similar question. So it's my bad that uh, I failed to, uh, in, in explaining uh, clearly about this whole difference between glucose and metabolism. And so uh, give me second chance so that I try to uh, explain this. So functional metabolism, ATP. Metabolism is a simply chemical reaction. And like I said, two different kinds of metabolism. One is energy releasing, and the other one is energy requiring. What if this metabolism is something energy requiring? Then it comes ATP. ATP comes to the rescue. Hey, I need some reaction. I need some chemical uh, the energy. And in many cases, I'm not saying always, but in many cases, ATP is the one that we use as a such energy source. We generate ATP like this. So that's why I said ATP is something like a rechargeable battery. So you have to recharge used uh, battery, which is ADP. Where is the energy source for the re recharging? Ultimately, glucose or any other food source. And this one is exactly what I was trying to explain. And uh, some of you have already understood and then uh, try to put this in cartoon form. Yeah, exactly. And some of you went further ahead. Uh, one special thing about this is, you know what? I noticed this. Whoever, whoever drew this, this S probably it, uh, meant this entropy. Wow. So that uh, student did not be around here. Uh, so anyway. So inside, hold energy. Outside energy go into and inside the synthesize. In synthesis, it requires energy. And also, uh, uh, in some occasions, break down. Produce energy is a little bit inaccurate, uh, the, the vocabulary, but anyway. Uh, and by doing so, outside of the world, always this Another parameter called entropy. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, uh, I don't want to go into the entropy because I always had. I always had uh, explained this entropy even in this uh, introductory biology course. But uh, I don't. Uh, in this uh, these days, in particular, I just wonder what's the uh, what's the worst? Was it worse? No, it wasn't. It doesn't make any difference, so I decided not to. Uh, well. Okay, it's a very cute Liger. Uh, I appreciate it. It's a really, really nice drawing. And speaking of this Liger, which is a hybrid between lion and tiger. Okay, so actually, lion and tigers are not a biologically separable species, and to uh, to be more accurate, because they can. They can make uh, and uh, produce uh, viable uh, offspring like this, but real life, Liger. Actually, there are two different versions depending on who's the father and who's the mother. Uh, in the case of a Liger, father is a lion and the mother was tiger and the Liger. And so, if the child was, happens to be a and it will look like this. <laughs> Well, in the case of a male ch a child, it will look like has a more lionish uh, the thing. But what about the other way around? If the mother was like a tiger and the father was a lion, what what happened? 
then we call differently as a Taigon. And same thing, uh, child, child of these two, the marriage, uh, the happy um, uh, male, then it will still retain some of the characteristics of uh, a so, uh, so, uh, little bit of a female lion. Uh, and in the case of uh, the female, as uh, just look like real photograph as it is. Okay, so there are two different Liger and Tigers out there. And I'm really sorry, uh, but don't, don't be upset. You are not the only one, as we have that a lot of those confusions going around. Uh, maybe some of the concepts that you have never, you are not familiar, it's just simply you are not really familiar with. And always it takes time. Uh, the learning cannot be uh, explained only very uh, only sheer pure logic sometimes. For some mysterious reason, it takes some time. Then mysteriously, after a while, then all these concepts become so clear to me uh, in my own experience too and personal experience and probably so will be yours too. Okay. So I spend too much time and this explanation. So let's get back to this. So the reason, getting back to the reason why we uh, need a chemical bond in the first place is because not everybody is perfect like uh, the previous uh, slide of helium or neon or argon, those who already fulfill their, the maximum number of electrons. There are only very few exceptions. The other vast majority of uh, uh, elements, uh, they are not perfect, so they are still in the process. Uh, of trying to reach that goal. For example, like hydrogen. How many more uh, electrons does this poor guy need? Just one more. If I have one more electron, then I can become perfect. Okay. What about in the case of uh, carbon? It's the matter becomes a little, little bit more complex, complicated because it needs four more electrons. Nitrogen, three more. Oxygen, two more. Just like that. So all these, all these who doesn't, uh, at current level, who doesn't have uh, the maximum number of electrons at their so-called outermost electron orbit, they have to constantly, they have to make efforts, constant efforts to have a such opportunity. That's the reason why chemical reaction occurs. So, with that, one such way of having such chemical reaction is the Ionic bond. Uh, one thing is ionic bond is something like a league of their own in that not everybody can participate in ionic bond. Can, only ions can do this ionic bond. What are ions? Only ions can have this ionic bond. But then hardly. What are ions? Yeah, those who have charged. Not everybody can have this uh, the electrical charge easily. How can you be charged? Is there any way? I want to be charged. How can I do that? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> right, exactly, electrons. So electron matters. 
if you want to become charged, either you dump electron or you obtain extra electrons. In the occasion of uh, obtaining ele extra electrons, you become what? Negative. You have one several extra electrons, negatively charged electrons, that you are not supposed to have originally. So that's why you become negatively charged. In the occasion of you somehow kick out some of your original electron, you will become positively charged because you have dumped your original uh, electron. So now your balance between positively, positively charged proton and electron, what you had originally, uh, is not equal. So that's why you become positively charged. So how can you become, can everyone become charged? That is the question. Not everybody uh, becomes so easily charged. Only there are some of the chosen elements can be easily charged. So those are the ones who easily engage in the ion. For example, very famous ionic bond uh, participant, sodium and chlorine. Then when they are not charged, they are simple like metal-like crystals. But when they have this special molecule now, it's called, we recognize the sodium chloride, it is a molecule uh, formed through ionic bond. Because, why? Because they, where are you? I forgot, I just uh, missed. I skipped this. Are there any sodium? Oh, no, it's not. So I have to improvise this. In the case of sodium, uh, it can become easily positively charged because uh, in, in its outermost electron shell, there is only one single electron moving around. So once you kick out this electron, one, 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 one electron, now the outermost electron shell becomes disappeared. And the next level, the electron shell, which is already fooled, okay, filled, uh, will become the outermost electron shell, which is the maximum, already having the maximum number of electrons. That's why sodium can uh, be easily positively charged by dumping one extra electron. On the other hand, chlorine has a totally opposite uh, the <coughs> scenario in that it has a seven electrons in the outermost electron shell orbit. So if chlorine has obtained, uh, gained one more electron, then it can become a perfect eight electron uh, composed outermost electron orbit. So that's why they can easily become either positively charged or, and negatively charged. And once they become ionized like this, charged, and then they can easily form this attraction between plus and minus, always a natural attraction, okay, charged. That's, that's the nature of this uh, ionic bond, right? So there are so many different such ionic bonds. When you have these ions, then uh, their equal amount, equal value of opposite charge can form easily this ionic bond. But the thing is, okay, so in biology, what's the uh, significance of this ionic bond? One is such sodium chloride and calcium chloride and magnesium chloride and etc. Such uh, the molecules form bonds are we usually called what? Right? Minerals. Right. Why do we call those as a mineral because in our body usually they do not exist like those uh, ionic bond uh, held together but individual ions like magnesium usually exist in the ionized form in our body, calcium, 
Uh, everybody knows the importance of calcium and iron. What about this iron? And by the way, just because you are not familiar with this uh, the power uh, element uh, symbols, don't you worry. It is not important and, and you will never have to worry anything like this about on your exam. No, I'm not. So, and so all these are important. There are some functional importances in, in, in these minerals in our body. Uh, and I don't really have to go over the real reason why these minerals are so uh, vital to our the maintenance of our life. But anyway, we uh, at the same time, we are all aware that there are many several important minerals that we need. And those minerals are uh, actually I cannot really stand like positively charged negatively charged minerals are all around associated with water molecule in because our whole life is based on water that's why they exist in the ionized mineral form instead of their original ionic bond uh, formed molecule. And these individual ions are actually acting as very significant in, in functionally in our biology. So that's one thing. And why these water molecules behave like this is that uh, I'm going to, I hopefully I will be able to go over that uh, today's too. And another very significant occasions that these ionic bonds are, are playing important role is here. This, everyone recognizes this as a DNA? Good, if, that, if so, good, okay. So this, this whole skeleton, Oh, this pattern like things represent a DNA, double helix DNA molecule. And uh, like I say briefly today, DNA in reality is not something that exists naked, so to speak, but they are covered, so tightly covered with many different proteins on the surface. Our DNAs are like that. And the mechanism, the way they can do this is because of the chemical nature of a specific protein. Some of the proteins are, they are their chemical characters are positively charged. And DNAs are basically intrinsically negatively charged, very highly negatively charged DNAs are. Why? Because of this phosphate. Phosphate groups are highly negatively charged in, uh, in biological uh, condition. So between negatively charged DNA and some specific positively charged protein, there is a specific ionic interactions established. And that is actually, in reality, this is a very significant thing. Uh, so that's another example of ionic bond in action in reality. So it is not something simple conceptual thing, but uh, playing significant uh, role. Now, covalent. So this is something, once we understand the ionic bond, then we can understand, we can feel for those who uh, rely on this covalent bond, like carbon, very one good example. Carbon, the number of electrons at the outside, very outside, as I mentioned, four. So this four is very uh, kind of a fuzzy, uh, un uncomfortable uh, condition, situation. Like, what you need is an eight. So to reach eight, either you dump all four or obtain four other additional things. Neither of them is very easy. So that's the reason why carbon cannot easily be engaged in ionic bond. Yeah. If I have something like a seven electrons, 
yeah, I would be easily hanging as an ionic bond instead. Or if I had only one or two electrons in my uh, out, outermost shell, then I can easily, I'm willing to dump these two. But my problem is I have four. What do I do? Dump all four or <laughs> try to bring whole new four? In that occasion, they have a whole new concept of sharing. Hey, do not think that all these electrons that you have to own, why don't we share some of the, uh, the electrons that you need with somebody else? It's like sharing like music. So that's the basic concept of a covalent bond. And actually hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas is another such an example of uh, the, uh, formed as a result of this covalent bond. Uh, like I mentioned, hydrogen only requires one more electron. Two hydrogen sign the contract. Hey, you and I both need one more electron. So why don't we simply from now on try to share these two electrons together so me can have two electrons. So we are like always go together, eat together, sleep together, because we are now just through this COVID. Sharing electrons, okay. So that's the concept of covalent bond. Hydrogen. Mm. Carbon. Try to seduce four hydrogen. And hey, so now, for carbon, now it became fully filled eight electrons because individually four different hydrogen joined in this so-called so covalent bond. So now carbon has eight electrons and each hydrogen have two electrons. They are also happy. So this is another example of covalent bond. Oxygen gas also actually. Here, actually, these two oxygens are not sharing only one, but two electrons at a time. So in this way, they, yeah, both of electron, uh, the oxygen element uh, can be happy like this. And water is also one oxygen having two hydrogen, both have this electron shared. So these are all examples of such a covalent bond. Um, so one thing that you notice over here is only covalent bond in so all these are uh, chemical so-called chemical formula. It is a kind of agreement among chemists to uh, represent or explain or describe uh, chemical nature or structure like this. So only in covalent bond case we designate the chemical bond in this like real. Uh, solid, solid line. Whenever you see solid line between or among different elements, that oh, that's a covalent bond. Ionic bond, you don't really get to see such thing usually. And hydrogen bond and Van der Waals and those things, they never. Uh, they never uh, be described in using this solid line. So whenever you see solid line between or among different elements, oh, that the connection between these are covalent bond. So that's the kind of agreement or convention. Now, another thing. Carbon having this ability or capability of forming four such covalent bond with somebody else at the same time is the one that actually make this carbon as very special and that's the reason why in organic chemistry like a macromolecule in organic macromolecule carbon is the one that actually centered uh, in our uh, attention carbon can make this whole extension 
of all this chemical covalent bond uh, highly expanded to make huge complex molecule because of this uh, chemical structure of geometry it can let's say this is carbon and you can have one covalent bond it, it, it can be occupied by another carbon or somebody else and then it can also go beyond like so this whole structure built through covalent bond can really really uh, hugely expand it. that's the nature of the macromolecule and that is the reason why only organic macromolecule is possible for example carbon is there carbon carbons have to be there because of this such special ability so carbon can be expanded like this and also carbon uh, another special uh, <coughs> characteristic of carbon is not only can they have this but also they have this circular ring shaped carbon so many various forms made also they can have this just like the case of oxygen this covalent bond can be double bond instead of a single bond. In some cases, actually, triple bond also can be formed. Okay. Now, um, not all covalent bonds are equally made. This is a representation of a water molecule. Water molecule is a result of covalent bond between one oxygen and two hydrogen, right? As you can see. So when they form this covalent bond, their agreement is what? We are going to share electrons equally, right? But in reality, this greedy oxygen doesn't do that. Doesn't keep up its promise of uh, having to is going to share the electron equally but once they form this covalent bond from then on all the electrons are usually around here oxygen side hydrogens hey you broke promise it's not fair but that's the reality hydrogen is very weak why is this thing happening because oxygen is greedy that's a kind of indication of something like electronegativity is the intrinsic chemical property of how greedy you are in terms of electrons. So their greediness, different elements have different greediness for electrons. Like one top notorious on the list is an oxygen. It's very high. So the higher the value, this, uh, it is more greedy in trying to grab the snatch the electrons so oxygen chlorine nitrogens are usually so these three guys are the problematic especially uh, more particularly this oxygen is the real problematic guy so whenever you have an oxygen it will cause oxygen is a troublemaker try to find some available oxygen and then try to take away that's why problem of reactive oxygen like a cause for the aging and cancer and because oxygen when they are highly active and try to find some other victims to get electrons and usually uh, those uh, <clears throat> the membrane and other very delicate structures are damaged by this action of uh, electrons and that's the, uh, the cause for more <coughs> deleterious uh, undesirable things like uh, aging and cancer is a kind of a well established uh, thing so oxygen one thing is oxygen is very prob problematic because of this nature property of uh, trying to attract 
others electrons. So you are actually in, uh, you are fooled by oxygen, and it's not. It's after all, it's your fault that you dis, you are deceived by oxygen. But anyway, from now on, you have to uh, adapt your kind of the <coughs> your situation. In other words, what happens is covalent bond to begin with uh, not supposed to generate any kind of a charge in principle. However, because of these differences, in reality, some charge, some not very straightforward apparent, but deliberate okay. A charge happens. So in oxygen side, there is a, some small <coughs> charge we call it as a partial charge, okay, minus. And on the hydrogen side, because of this uh, lack of electron uh, spending time over here, it will be become partially positively charged. So in other words, what's the point? Water molecule, water is polar. Water molecule is polar. Anything that becomes charged, we declare that molecule is polar. This is something, one carbon, four hydrogen, actually its name happens to be methane, yeah, but who cares about its name? But it is, is it polar or non-polar? You tell me. This chemical, methane, is it polar or non-polar? Hey, how am I supposed to know? You are, you can, you can know. So this is why, uh, after all, this is the structure of methane. Is it going to be polar or non-polar? Non, because carbon is a fair guy. It doesn't actually show any uh, unreasonable greed. So whenever you have some kind of a relationship, a contract with carbon, you can be safe usually. So it's going to be non-polar. Whenever you have some relationship with oxygen, you definitely create some situation of a polar. Oxygen, there is oxygen, then there is a polar. Uh, is there any another kind of a potential such uh, the uh, valent other than oxygen? Not showing over here, but nitrogen is another. So whenever you see oxygen or nitrogen, then oh, because of that guy, uh, that molecule is going to be, there is a very good chance of uh, this molecule is going to be a polar. Of course, uh, look, up, look at this electronegativity. Oxygen, nitrogen, these are the above carbon, and these guys are highly electronegative and when they have some molecule uh, having this these guys a presence then this molecule is going to be a polar charge obviously of course uh, other occasions of it being polar would be ionic okay ionic bonds are more straightforward polar but water H2O doesn't show any uh, charge, apparently, but still they are polar because of this oxygen. So we can determine using this clue. When you see plus or minus sign on the chemistry, then definitely this molecule is going to be polar. In other occasion, you don't see any plus or minus sign, but still when you see many oxygen, or you, when you see many nitrogen or both, oh, then this molecule is going to be polar. Why? Why am I bringing up this? That actually determines some, we <coughs> expect some particular molecules behavior or function according to 
is polarity. Why? Because our whole system is based upon what? Water. And water is what? Polar. So either, just like George Bush <laughs> once uh, have said, either you are with us or against us. That's what George Bush has uh, said and uh, tried to make everybody else in the world like I, uh, our like forced friends or enemies. Just like same thing in, uh, in the biology, in, world, in the world of biology. Either you are water friendly or water enemy of water. Either one of them. All these different molecules can be divided can be into two different categories. Water Water loving. They have no problem with dealing with this water. Hey, what is fine? What is fair? I can deal with water. Those molecules we uh, <coughs> regard them as uh, water friendly. How do we how do we name water friendly molecule? Hydro. Philic. Yeah. All this hydrophilic. But is there any way we can determine? Even without testing, using experiment, is there any way we can determine, oh, that molecule is going to be hydrophilic? Is there any way? Any kind of rule we can use? Other, otherwise, we have to, every time we discover or we, want, we are curious about the behavior of any molecule, we have to test whether this molecule is going to be water friendly or water, what's the opposite of water uh, friendly? Hydrophobic, good. So all these molecules, different molecules, macromolecules, either this or that, hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Why is that important? Because no matter what, you have to live with water. Whether you are hydrophilic or, or hydrophobic, then it will make difference in your behavior and function. For example, cholesterol. Cholesterol is very famous hydrophobic molecule. Cholesterol is a lipid, hydrophobic. So you make cholesterol in the liver. You have to deliver once produce cholesterol to other every different part of your body through what? Blood. The blood is basically what? Water. Cholesterol cannot get, on, get along very well with water. Then how uh, am I supposed to deliver this cholesterol so uh, well through this water? There is no way you can do so. Is there any way you can do? Because of that, you have to You have to come up with some kind of other weird material called the LDL. Have you heard of this LDL? Probably, yes. LDL has a bad cholesterol. This LDL is actually a collection of the cholesterol covered with hydrophilic coating of a protein. So that they can easily, more easily be associated with the watery blood. It's a transport form. So a cell always have to worry about this type of things. Whether this molecule well behave well, associated very well with water. If not, then you have to come up with some kind of a measure to overcome this. LDL is one such example. And because of that, actually, LDL associated problem occurs later. Not, not going to touch uh, today, but anyway. So, Hydrophilic, hydrophobic is very important to anticipate the function of any uh, macromolecule. But the problem is there's got to be some kind of clue for us to determine whether certain molecule is going to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Otherwise, hey, life is not fair then. 
then I'm not going to study biology because it's such a garbage study that every, every time you have to determine or memorize or uh, the experiment, do the experiment, no way. So that's got to be some kind of an easy way to decide, which is huh? polarity, exactly, yes. Whether all these hydrophilic molecules, the common characteristic, is going to be what? Polar. If this molecule is going to be polar, then it's definitely is going to be hydrophilic. In other words, the opposite is true. If this molecule is going to be non-polar, then it's going to be hydrophobic. Why lipid? All those lipids are hydrophobic. Now is explained. Lipids are basically non-polar molecule. All you have is a carbon, 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 or hydrogen, 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 all this. Carbon, hydrogen. With only these two combination does not generate any polarity. So that's why all these oils and such lipids are hydrophobic and they don't get mixed very well with the water. On the other hand, any molecule containing, of course, not to mention any charged molecule, they will definitely be hydrophilic. So not to mention any charged molecule, but also other among non-charged molecule, if you get to see many oxygen or many nitrogen, then definitely they are going to be polar. So you don't really, you don't really uh, worry too much about it. By just looking at those chemistry, then you know it, this property. And that's one of the reasons why we actually uh, take the trouble to uh, go over this all this miscellaneous chemistry over here. Later on, at least we can have some clue out of this effort. Yep. Sorry. So anyway, hydrogen bond is now, uh, still I am on the hydrogen bond. I'm too slow. So because of this, there is a partial charge that the water, individual water molecule become polar. So any polar molecule can have this kind of attraction, right? Between this and that. Obviously, of course, in, uh, at the individual water molecule basis, these two parts cannot have any interaction, obviously. However, uh, in real life scenario, water molecule does not exist as a single molecule, but ton, ton of different water molecules do exist. For, uh, if you think, simply think about two water molecules in the whole bunch of million or gazillion uh, number of water molecules, but at least if you zoom in as one uh, occasion of two water molecules, hey, here, Oxygen side, there is a partial negative, but neighboring water molecules, hydrogen side, positively. So to do, 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 do some attraction between positive and negative, right? That's what we call hydrogen bond. So this hydrogen bond is something that uh, <coughs> happened as a byproduct of this covalent bond of special nature, we call it as a polar covalent bond, okay, whatever. Uh, so in reality, in like environment, hydrogen bond can only be possible in these two occasions. Obviously hydrogen bond, there has to be hydrogen. Of course, but not all hydrogen, but some very specific hydrogen happens to be associated with this unfortunate covalent bond with oxygen. Then now this hydrogen become positively, partially 
and neighboring oxygen has already negative, partially negatively charged. Then there is between this hydrogen and oxygen, there is a two, 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 two hydrogen bond. Another possibility is this hydrogen having this oxygen covalent bond, so this positively charged, of course. But then nitrogen is also another such negatively charged the area provider. So between nitrogen and hydrogen can also have this hydrogen bond. So there are only two these such possibilities. By the way, this particular figure, I took it from your textbook. Huh? So not the whatever the lecture handout, but actually the textbook that I gave you okay, uh, is the one of the figure describes the nature of this hydrogen bond, right? Uh, so these water molecules integrity as a whole structure integrity is actually uh, maintained, established and maintained by this hydrogen bond. Okay. Also, big molecule, big like for example protein, big protein molecule like this, there is a one area and another area at the end, two area, but there is a, always some kind of occasion, possibility between these two parts having this hydrogen bond. So in other words, especially big molecule like a protein, protein's overall shape, protein is, but real protein shape is something like it's random garbage-like structure. And this shape is largely, not all, but largely different parts of these areas of individual component of a protein uh, providing this hydrogen bond, this whole overall shape is uh, built. So, once again, uh, that's the reason why I should bring up this hydrogen bond, because it's so important. Okay. Covalent, hydrogen, and also ionic, these are all, for that reasons, they are actually very important chemical bond that we cannot ignore. Okay, so and characteristics of a hydrogen bond is very weak. Obviously, yeah, even weaker than the ionic bond. Covalent bond is the strongest, and probably next stronger one, still weaker, much weaker, is the ionic bond maybe. And hydrogen bond is even weaker than ionic bond. But, so, such a weak chemical bond, I mean, what's the usage of such a weak bond? But in mass, it creates huge important factors, just like a Velcro. You know, everyone uh, recognizes and then the Acknowledge, acknowledge the power of a Velcro. Individual Velcro, the connection is very weak, but all together, when you have this Velcro, it's just fairly strong enough to hold anything. And exactly, this hydrogen bond is behaving like Velcro. Okay? What's, what's Korean for Velcro? Chik chiki, right. That's exactly the uh, providing such a strong power all together, right. So water, Actually, what is very a mysterious molecule in that uh, the reason why water is a liquid is because of this uh, partially all the time at random uh, places uh, hydrogen bonds are established, being established as well as broken at the same time. That's why uh, water can be filled in any different uh, like container. Uh, so, like a liquid uh, characteristics comes from such a hydrogen bond. So, like, as you can see in this figure, and also ice. The, uh, why ice usually is a solid? The solid form of water, liquid, is ice, right? But still, one thing, interesting thing is ice floats on top of liquid water. Usually that is not the case for other Usually, the, uh, 
material. When you become solid, it will sink to the bottom. Why in the case of water, ice float on top? Because of this hydrogen bond. In the case of ice, there is a certain very limited, very tightly controlled space among between every water molecule formed hydrogen bond. That's, however, water and the liquid randomly here and there partially hydrogen bonds are broken and instead so more number of molecules in a given space can be squeezed into accommodated. So that means liquid in water, liquid is higher higher density. Density means in a given volume, how many molecules are there it determines the density. So unusually, in case of water, liquid has a higher density because of this characteristic. And why do we have to care about such thing? Because it makes life in the temporal region. If, if ice start form from the bottom in the winter, then we have to restart the whole new creation. But since ice form on top, leaving bottom still watery, uh, like survival, they remain. And then when the bad condition like spring comes and they restart. It's very important for life sustaining in such a uh, temperate region like that. Uh, there are so many others, so many other characteristics uh, which re uh, are related with the uh, water like this, but uh, I mean, you can go over on your own about uh, additional characteristics of water associated with the hydrogen bond on the lecture out. I'm not going to uh, go over every bit of detail today because it's, uh, yeah, it's about the closing time. So, so bond and it's a bit when you finish on the hydrogen bond. So when I when I can finish actually oh. But anyway, but provide very strong force. DNA hold DNA. Uh, everyone, uh, we all know that DNA exists in two double stranded structure like this, and the those are all hydrogen bond and. So this hydrogen bond is the one responsible for holding two DNA strands together. Yes. And not only that, proteins hold shape like I described earlier. They and as well as other things so hold this macromolecule uh, structural integrity uh, maintenance is actually uh, providing main in large part not only but. Very uh, weak, but very strong altogether. Is the what this hydrogen bond in nature? Have you said that? Okay, I will here continue on about the rest of the things. Uh, so, have a nice weekend and see you next. Time.